Good morning, supervisors. Supervisor Stephanie, thank you so much for inviting the departments here today. I am Roland Pickens, director of the San Francisco Health Network, which is the integrated delivery system of the Department of Public Health. Uh, we thought it was important to have Dr. Zevin really start off this presentation uh, because it represents someone on the front lines every day who's working with our homeless uh, substance abuse and mentally ill uh, constituents. Uh, he also, many of those services that he referenced uh, are from our various departments who work together. They weren't all DPH programs. They also included HSH and HSA. And so we are here, I'm joined by colleagues from HSA and HSH, uh, and we'll do this presentation and hopefully provide you with an overview of the services we provide both individually and collectively through a coordinated process. Uh, I think it's important to note a couple of years ago, I didn't know my colleagues in HSH and HSA, but because of the crisis we've seen on our streets, it's really forced us to get to know each other and to work collaboratively. This past summer, we actually held a retreat for all three departments, had our key individuals there, and have really come up with an action plan on how we can better coordinate our services on behalf of our citizens. I'd like to start with uh, just an overview uh, between our three departments, last year uh, we provided service to, services to over 13,000 individuals experiencing homeless. Uh, our collective uh, mantra is that no door is the wrong door. And actually, there shouldn't be any doors. It's really about seeing our clients where they are, and many times that's on the street. Um, we, when we encounter individuals on the street, uh, that is done through a collaborative approach uh, by both DPH, HSH, and HSA. In DPH, our prominent um, programs are street medicine, which is led by Dr. Zevin, which includes physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, um, um, psychiatrists, spe specialty physicians, uh, nurses, and peers who are actually out on the street providing real medical care to patients but also not only providing that care, but also linking them to more permanent types of medical care like primary care and urgent care. Uh, we also have engagement specialists, and these are typically like a health worker level individual and oftentimes peers, people who had previously been homeless uh, or uh, addicted to uh, substances and who are really out there and can relate to individuals that they encounter on the streets. Uh, and within HSH, uh, they have the the uh, homeless outreach team. And that's really probably the biggest team that's out there throughout the city and in key neighborhoods where they're actively engaging individuals on the street. And then our colleagues within HSA, they provide a very important uh, component, which is making sure that individuals have access to benefits because those benefits can be that stabilizing force that really keeps them on the right track. And so how does this all come together? Uh, within the last 18 months, it's really come together in a couple of places. The most prominent one is HSOC, which you've heard about before, Healthy Streets Operations Center. Uh, that's where we combine with other partners like the police department, uh, like the Department of Public Works, uh, on an everyday basis. And it's really like an air traffic control. You mentioned that call to the non-emergency number. Those calls come into HSOC. Uh, all the parties are at the table and really determine who's best, how are we gonna treat this particular call. Most often it involves the uh, homeless outreach team as the first responders to that, but it may involve some of our street specialists or street medicine or EMS-6 from the fire department. Uh, or it may involve uh, the police department depending upon the, the nature of the call. So in terms of roles and collaborations, uh, you can imagine public health, our primary role is to provide medical and behavioral health services, uh, HSH, uh, our housing partners, and HSA, those benefits uh, linking services. And then the police, you know, we're fortunate to have a police force that's out on the streets and actually have relationships with some clients. And so we rely upon them and to be their partners to support them in their outreach activities. We already talked about HSOC, but another way that we all come together is through what's called whole person care. 
Whole Person Care is a uh, program through the state of California's 1115 Medicaid waiver that provided funding to counties within California to focus on uh, high utilizer populations. In San Francisco, uh, DPH, HSH, HSA, we've all come together the past two years in our whole person care program to again figure out how we can co collaborate better to provide services. One of the things we, um, uh, I mentioned the uh, retreat we did this past summer. One of the things that came out of that treat, retreat was we needed to have a better way to prioritize uh, who would get what services, both in terms of who would get priority in terms of housing, but also who would get priority to health care, mental health, and substance abuse services. I'd like to share uh, this, um, this uh, upside down triangle really represents the spectrum of behavioral health care services that are provided within the Department of Public Health. And I want to uh, really highlight that behavioral health includes both substance abuse services and mental health services. Uh, just to um, acclimate you to this uh, graph, on the right-hand side, you see uh, acuity level. Uh, this uh, picture shows acuity from the lowest, which is really um, those are early prevention activities all the way to the highest, which are locked uh, mental health uh, facilities. Now, Dr. Zevin uh, provided you with um, a, a pretty illustrative case of what uh, our various departments and our workers encounter on a daily basis. Uh, but we wanted to give you some uh, even more general uh, overviews of how uh, individuals are encountered and then how we work together and collaborate. So in this, um, in this scenario, it's, it's a scenario of someone uh, actively using substances on the street. Uh, in many cases, someone like this, uh, the call may come into HSOC, or it may be one of the uh, SF hot team members or our engagement specialists who encounter this individual on the street. Uh, that encounter may take place over several days, several months, because oftentimes, it's never one encounter, it's just that repetitive process. Um, so for example, John may have been engaged over several, several weeks or months by an engagement specialist uh, in attempting to refer him to treatment. He finally decides he's ready to uptake on that uh, treatment and he develops a relationship with that engagement specialist. That engagement specialist will oftentimes either walk John over or drive John over to what's called treatment access uh, program. That's located at 1380 Howard Street run by DPH. That's the place where all of the substance abuse beds and services coordinated by DPH are, are centralized there. They're able to see where is there an available bed uh, for, for John since he's ready to access service. Uh, those types of services include um, residential treatment. Uh, these are actually facilities, um, many of which are run by Health Right 360. They're usually a 90-day, but it can go more or less depending upon what the individual needs, and they're able to be placed there. In addition, while John is in that residential treatment center, uh, HSH, uh, is involved, and they're putting him through their coordinated, uh, coordinated uh, entry process, which then prioritizes uh, where he is in the housing pipeline. Uh, the second scenario. Uh, hold, hold, hold. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Super Supervisor uh, Ronan has questions, and I have questions. Okay. Thank you, Chair Mandelman. Um So, a, a couple questions. Well, first of all, um, I know that. Uh, 90, what I've been told is that 90% of individuals that are suffering from a mental health disease um, have also a, a, an accompanying substance abuse um, uh, addiction. Th th yeah. That's what mm -hmm. some care providers have told me. That's, that's their estimate of the okay. figure. So are, are we just talking about someone that just has a substance abuse disease but not an accompanying Mental health. I mean, my, yeah. my understanding is that they're oftentimes uh, 
co-occurring conditions. That's true. And actually, they're oftentimes uh, trimorbid, not only the mental health mm -hmm. condition, the physical. substance abuse, but also a physical condition so like hypertension. When is the decision to ma made whether or not to go into a Health Right 360 residential treatment program yeah. or a, you know, Conard House or, right. um, you know, Progress Foundation uh, uh, residential treatment program where the emphasis is a little bit different. Um, Conard House and Progress mm -hmm. being more the mental, the, the mental health being pri uh, pri the primary disease mm -hmm. and Health Right 360, the substance abuse being the primary right. disease. So the benefit of that TAP treatment access program that I talked about, it's actually co-located with its mental health uh, uh, partner, which is called the BHAC, Behavioral Health Access Center. So they're, they're in the same place. So if the person needs a mental health placement or a substance abuse placement, they're in the same room so they can determine which way that person needs to go. And so is that a doctor who makes that determination? Who, who makes yeah, that determination? Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll have our director of behavioral health kind of uh, Kavus Ganabasiri, but it's usually a, a social worker or, or some kind of clinician or someone who's been trained in knowing what is the priority of, um, number one, the availability, but also what is the clinical presentation of that individual. So they may, depending upon that presentation, they will review and say, based upon these criteria, you need this level of care. Okay. So the assessment, uh, good morning, supervisors. The assessment uh, is done by a, a qualified practitioner and that uh, may be a clinical social worker, a licensed marriage family therapist, or our nurse practitioner, um, and these individuals all are qualified to diagnose and provide assessment and treatment. Uh, so that is the structure at any given time when we're trying to look at the assessment. Or, and also for our treatment access program, we have people who are certified in drug and alcohol uh, counseling, which is a requirement uh, for a lot of the substance use provider treatment uh, sort of uh, group to have that discipline and that specialty as well. So how, how often, so after that assessment is made about whether or not, you know, Health Rights 360's type program or a Conard House Progress Foundation type program is more um, focused towards the individual, how often is a bed available in one of those programs to immediately send a person there? So for mental health beds versus substance use residential, and we also have detox. Uh, so there's detox and then substance use residential treatment, and then we also have recovery step down as, uh, uh, as, as another level. For mental health, if someone needs to go into a residential treatment or a mental health residential facility, that is actually processed through our transitions team, which they will do the assessment and they will make the uh, determination of the ac acuity, the criteria. But also a lot of times people may not need necessarily go directly to there. They may go to an acute diversion unit, stay there for a few weeks, and then based on that assessment decide what's the next step. So when someone comes in uh, to our treatment access program, that one is for substance use assessment as well as uh, placement into a detox or residential uh, treatment for substance use, and someone can also go directly to the uh, to the uh, to the center as well. They can go directly to Health Right 360, and then they send the authorization to us. Uh, well, we just want to make it more uh, sort of accessible. So, for substance use residential treatment, we usually actually have availability. And that is something that I think it's not known a lot of times. There, uh, the other day when you had the uh, hearing on, uh, at, for HSOC, we had a number of residential treatment beds available. Um, and it wasn't that we were holding them. It's, there are numerous reasons why someone may choose not to go in. They choose to have different, you know, different ways that the assessment shows that they may not need, meet the criteria or they meet the criteria they're not interested. They may need to go to detox first. They may choose to sort of think about it. So there's not as pressure. I mean, we definitely want to make sure we always have treatment that's available for substance use treatment. But I would say the pressure there is a little bit less because it's, it's really trying to make sure that we can get the person in and they're willing and they're... And then the reason also sometimes those are less is because 
somebody may get in, but there's no, they're not mandated to stay there. So they may s- suddenly be out the next day, or they may two days later not stay there. So the beds become available on an ongoing basis, mm-hmm. uh, at, depending on how long someone stays. For okay. residential so, mental health, yeah. that is actually, there is a list, and there is a wait, um, and there's not always immediate accessibility. What is and, that wait time? Uh, that one, I think our transition team, I mean, it could be weeks to months uh, because uh, depending, again, on the location as well. What's the average wait time? Um, I would say it, it would be a few months. Um, I mean, we have so actually... So three a, months? Huh? It could be for a residential treatment. Do we know um, what the average wait time is? We do. I, have, I don't have the document in front of me because we actually now have been tracking exactly how long the waits are for each uh, uh, setting, so I can get that. Does in. anybody have that number? No. I mean, this is the yeah. subject we of the have hearing. Right, can right. we get it right now? Can yeah. we, yeah. Could can, someone find that number yeah. right now? Um, the Lauren, other sure. question that I have is I'm hearing two totally different things, so I want to clarify this, and I think that's the whole point of this mm-hmm. meeting is that Every time any one of my, myself or my colleagues tries to get into this subject matter, there are not consistent answers. There, you, you talk to every person that works for the city, and you will hear a completely different story and answer and emphasis. And that's why I appreciate uh, uh, my colleague, Supervisor Stephanie, for calling this hearing. I think it's incredibly needed, and I, and I don't feel like we have a system that makes sense. So I heard from Mr. Pickens that... Everyone's assessed at the TAP level. Mm -hmm. Then I hear from you, um, uh, Caboose, that that's not the case. That if the primary, so if you you present, you you finally agree after many outreach attempts by the HOT team and by DPH's engagement specialists, um, and I'd love to hear how they work together, but that's a whole other story, that the person finally agrees to be assessed at TAP. They go to TAP and either a nurse practitioner or a licensed social worker who has the clinical expertise to make an assessment about whether the primary sort of need for this individual is a mental health disease or it's a substance abuse disease. And then, and then if it's substance abuse, there's a bed available usually at Health Right 360 if the person is willing and able to, you know, ready to go. And I, and I get that. But if it's a mental health disease, then they're not sent to a residential treatment program. What happens so, to them? Where do they go? So for mental health uh, at our treatment access or BHAC, where it's again uh, mental health and substance use treatment access, that is not where we would determine the placement for residential mental health. Uh, that is for figuring out what the needs are and assessing that for our different levels of care. If, if someone needs a wait, residential... Wait, 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 wait. Mm-hmm. Sorry, can we clarify? Because sure. you just said yeah. that they're assessed there and then mm-hmm. triaged or sent to the right place. So, right. so where is of, the disconnect here? Yeah. And, and can you correct it, the record sure. then? Yeah, so part of that assessment is what level of service do they need? Do they need an outpatient appointment with a clinician where they can come and go, or do they really need a, a residential treatment where they actually have to go and stay? So uh, that decision, uh, that assessment is done at BHAC and based upon whatever wait, wait, the presentation... BHAC is TAP? Uh, BHAC is TAP. They're, okay. they're, they're co-located. I'm sorry about the, the, the lingo, okay. but they are all in one big room at 1380 Howard, and it's kind of like the... the air traffic control for mental health and substance abuse programs. Okay. So uh, walk me through this. That's what we're doing here. We're looking at scenarios. So the individuals at BHAC slash TAP, (laughs) they're being evaluated by either a nurse practitioner or a licensed social worker. It is determined that this individual has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or severe depression and, and that we need to treat that before we deal with substance abuse. That's the primary driver of why the person is on the street or, or, or not succeeding in society. And then where, what happens to that person? So at that time, the question is, that, is, this, is this a housing issue or a treatment issue? So those are two things we have, we have to kind of determine. But we're, so we're, this treatment. hearing is about people experiencing yeah. homelessness. So. so this person is homeless. So where, what happens to this person? So if the person is homeless, there are people who are homeless uh, 
we are basically we're trying to figure out what is the treatment option for them. Do they need outpatient? Do they need case no, management? I, Do they need, if they need housing? Okay, so, as, so uh, let, let me try to make this easy. It is clear this person needs a residential behavioral treatment bed, but there's a 90-day waiting list, although right. you don't have that number yeah, here today, yeah. which is frustrating, but you're going to get it for me. Yeah. So, that, so that person may be, would probably be referred to a navigation center to, to get them off the street. But it's a person who's schizophrenic or has right. bipolar, so they cannot mm -hmm. deal with 125 to right. now. Now they're looking at a 225 mm -hmm. bed model congregate living situation. They can't handle it. Yeah. So what happens to this person? Right. So that person is offered either a therapist to work with them, or if they're in crisis, they may be taken to a PES, depending, again, depending upon the manifestation of that person. If they're calm and, and sedate. Okay, let's walk yeah. this through. Okay. So they're sent or, or from Hummingbird, just to like help yeah. out the, the department a little bit. The, the NAV center that exists for this population yeah. is Hummingbird, which is dr right. not nearly enough beds, right? But anyway. Right. So, so I just, but I just want to understand. Yeah. So, okay, so they're at TAP. It's determined that, that, they, that they have a mental health disease and they need help. Their options are they either go to PES, they may go to Hummingbird if one of 15 beds is open, which is very rare. I'd love to find out about the, the, the number of beds that are open at Hummingbird as well, if you could get that data for me if you don't have it right now. Um, or they go where? It, uh, they could also go to door urgent care, and within or door, urgent, door care. urgent care, they can decide if that person needs acute diversion, and they would go to a housing uh, for two weeks or plus, depending on their needs and how long they need to continue being assessed. So they may go from door urgent care directly to an acute diversion unit, which Progress Foundation has. There are four of those. And then while they're there, they're continuously assessing what the next steps would be. So okay. that's also another So option. let's say they go to door urgent care route, which is probably the, the best route because there's a 12-day crisis stabilization program there. They go to door 12 days, but there's still no bed in the residential treatment <coughs> program. So where do they go? From the ADU, uh, they're done with the ADU, and now the question is where they go next. Yes. I think at that time, there will be a lot of case conferencing done, depending on the condition of the person, to decide what is the next step. We may work with HSH about looking at stabilization rooms. We may be looking at various you know, options. So again, residential treatment is one option. And then again, we have to look at the condition of the person. Not every person is presenting in a situation that are in a crisis. Uh, there are people but, who but are also are, presenting that are not in a crisis that they need immediate But they're homeless and they're oh, schizophrenic correct. or bipolar okay. or mm -hmm. severe depression. Okay. So I guess... So first I guess, there are people with a schizophrenia or people with a bipolar. They, they have a lot of other aspects of themselves and the illness is one piece of Of course, them. of course. I'm and, sorry if I didn't use the right lingo. there are people who have schizophrenia who are doing yeah. very well, who are functioning, who are engaging, who, have, who are compliant and are actually very much Productive. But this is so. But, these you're talking about a very, very highly sort of acute and someone who is in a major crisis. Well, no, episode. I'm, ta I'm And that would be a different approach we would have versus someone who has schizophrenia and I'm may just actually trying, have I'm many I'm just trying other. to yeah. understand the process. Right. So I'm following the person in your example mm -hmm. who's someone who has been engaged several times by HOT or mm -hmm. the engagement specialists at DPH. So this mm -hmm. is a person who's been living on the street. Mm -hmm. It's the person that every right. single person in this room so, has seen. Right. countless times who's talking to themselves or who is, you know, in, in really poor yeah. condition, who it's, needs help, right? Yeah. It's the person so, yeah. that Catherine Stephanie right. was talking about when she opened up this hearing. So that's who we're yeah. talking about, yeah. who we see every day on the streets in San Francisco. And so I'm just, what we're all trying to mm -hmm. understand and what we've all try, been trying to understand mm -hmm. for a really long no, time so is supervisor where Rodin. does the system right. break down? Okay. Yeah. Because we yeah. have a broken system. Right. There's yes. no question in my can mind. I, can I just interject? really quick, Supervisor Ronan, sure. just because I, I see where you get and I, I understand, uh, of course, the passion behind um, making sure that we have enough resources. And it's exactly why I called for this hearing. So when the individual is at TAP or BHAC and uh, you're trying to figure out, because they're voluntarily there and they want a place to go to get better, right? So at that point in time, I think we as legislators want to know 
what are you thinking at that point in time that you are lacking that we might be able to try to provide for you budgetary wise? Like, what could we be doing better in terms of like, is somebody is a caseworker at that point in time thinking, gosh, I really wish there was another mental health bed for this person. Gosh, I wish there was really another residential treatment bed that we can get this person into so that this person doesn't have to go back out onto the streets. We are pleading and wanting to know from you, like your wish list of what you to, to basically serve everyone that is coming through tap and be hacked. I can I, I can tell you that yeah. wish list is more humming more hummingbird type. That's what beds. we want to know. Yes. That's what we want to know. Yes. That's why I call this hearing. How, where do we invest our dollars? Right. How do we not put yeah. someone back out onto the street yeah. that is at this point in mm-hmm. time? And I think that's what Supervisor yeah. Ronan is getting. Mm-hmm. Tell us your wish list sure. as big as it is. Just tell us yeah. what you need, and then yeah. we will do everything we can right. to try to get it. Sure, it's more. Hummingbird, which is like a psych respite type facility, and also um, more uh, what we call LSAT, locked subacute. That's like the San Francisco Healing Center, which is collaboration between DPH, UCSF, and Dignity, where we opened up these locked psychiatric beds. Those are probably the two biggest areas of investment, um, psych you, respite and LSAT. Can you clarify where, if may I jump in for a second? Yes. Okay. Um, can you clarify where Hummingbird is now in terms of number of beds? Because it wasn't yeah. 15, then it got expanded. We're, I think, at more than 15 at this point, I hope. Yes. Hmm? We are at 29. Okay. And, and are you full? Typically, Hummingbird is do you always... Need, do you need a lot more? Hummingbird is always full. Always full. And you have a daytime at Hummingbird as well. So even though... Right. They're going to accommodate about 25 people just during the day uh, up until 6 o'clock. And, and just to follow up too, it's not it's not just my it's not just about what the city and county of San Francisco can provide and what you need from us in terms of how we invest our dollars, but I want to know in terms of beds, what could our other hospitals be doing? What do you need them to step up and do? Mm-hmm. So we that's the information we want. What can sure. we ask Kaiser to do? Right. What can we ask CPMC to do? Mm-hmm. I want to know what we need, right. and then I want to know how to get it. Right. I want to know how we provide it as a city and how we ask our mm-hmm. other hospitals mm-hmm. in this town to provide right. it. Well, the Healing Center is a great example of that. That was DPH. Dignity Healthcare through St. St. Mary's and UCSF coming together to say we need more LSAT locked um, subacute treatment beds, uh, and we formed that um, facility at St. Mary's about two years ago. And um, what does that mean? What is a locked subacute treatment bed? So it, it means the individual can't come and go as they please. Um, so, but they don't need an acute hospitalization. Exactly. So they would be inappropriate. At, yes. at SF General. That's and in correct. fact, we would have a hard time justifying keeping them there. That's absolutely. But they need a place to go, yes. and they can't be released onto the street. If they are released onto the street, that's a problem, too. Yes. And we also don't want to send them out of county. Correct. Okay. So that's what the point of expanding the healing center, which we did yes. with the ERAF dollars, was. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And those... Um, I, I think I... that Supervisor Stephanie is eager to have us continue, but I know Supervisor Ronan also has some more questions, and I actually, I'm sorry, but I have a couple more, too. Yeah, I wanted to follow up. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. But I, I, I so I'll, instead of following the line that I still have a lot of questions about that I started and feel like have not gotten answers for, um, when you, fo- I'll, I'll follow up with what Supervisor Stephanie said. So Hummingbird is a, it's a navigation center. And granted, it's a navigation center that is focused on people with behavioral health um, conditions, but it's a temporary place for homeless individuals to be. Mm-hmm. It's not a treatment plan. It's not a. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not going to stabilize the individual or have or get them to a place. So, so in other words, what next for someone from Hummingbird? Where Where are the exits? Yeah from Hummingbird? Where, where do those people who fill those 29 beds every single night go? Right, right. So, so I would say that it is a stabilizing force because, number, for one, it gets people off the streets. No, no, so I understand been, that, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm, looking for, I'm yeah. looking for a path mm-hmm. yeah. that 
that we're, you know, I believe yeah. that everyone can get well right. and that everyone with the right set of circumstance can um, be, be somewhat reintegrated into society, maybe hold down a certain job, maybe live in, mm -hmm. in a housing situation that isn't as restrictive mm -hmm. as a residential treatment program. So I guess with, if that's where I'm starting from, that okay. is my firm belief. What, what is our path True. in San Francisco to, to get that person right. there? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, the, it, 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 it worries me that, that you're telling us that the two things that we need is a navigation, more navigation center beds and more locked subacute beds. Because while those are both very important, I don't believe that those are the two pieces that are going to get a person to reintegrate society right. and no longer go through that cycle on the street of where they get to 850, 150s, et cetera, right? right. And, and so that's where I'm, I, I'm just looking for a vision from uh, our departments that say, here is our system, here's how it works, here's how you get from point A to point being back in society and having a chance at a life again and off the street. And I have yet to understand or, or hear that, that yeah. system. Mm -hmm. So, I, Supervisor Ronan, I've gone back to the reverse triangle. This, this represents all those services you're talking about. I, we have outpatient, we have peers, we have vocational uh, rehab programs for individuals with substance abuse and mental health. They're all embedded within here. We can give you a list of 50 to 100 different programs and services that we offer. And so for that person in Hummingbird, they're just not sitting there all day. If they're there, they're plugged into coordinated entry for HSH to see can they, where can, how can they get to more permanent housing. They're also plugged into which DPH programs can they go into to get that help that you're asking about. I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with looking at Jeff Kaczynski. Do you have something to add here? I do. Thank you, yes. uh, Supervisor. I know uh, further in the presentation uh, we mapped some of that out, but I okay. think what, what you're asking, uh, just so I understand, is you know, somebody who's experiencing mental health issues or severe uh, substance use disorders are on the streets. How do they end up getting into permanent housing? How do they get better? How do we house them? Well, and then getting back to Supervisor Stephanie's question, and where... What's the gap? Where's the, where are the gaps? What should we yep. be fighting for? Is it, I, I, I just, I have a, I know we need more of everything, right? But I, I just have a hard time believing that more nav center beds or more locked subacute beds are really the, the missing link to get us to a system that works more seamlessly and so that we actually are helping people and, and see a difference in our city. Um, so I, I could share you know, my thoughts if now is sure. an appropriate time to do that. Um, one thing you know, I, I do want to say that has improved, uh, as you know, Roland pointed out earlier, uh, prior to our department existing, uh, there wasn't a lot of um, interaction like we've been having to create a system. So one of the good developments you know, is that now that we're using coordinated entry rather than a waiting list system in order to get people into housing, people who are the, you know, folks who are the least likely to be able to navigate the system are now the ones who are prioritized for housing. So we have access points now um, at the hospital. Uh, we're starting to work with Laguna Honda to make sure that their clients, who are the people that we're really talking about, are the ones that are getting prioritized for our permanent supportive housing. So that is the overall vision from an HSH perspective. Uh, what we need to be more successful at doing this um, is more you know, high quality permanent supportive housing, the type uh, Supervisor Stephanie that we visited uh, earlier this week, Richardson Apartments, Rene Casanave Apartments, uh, and others uh, that are newly constructed with a high level of services. And I used to run facilities like this earlier in my career, and I have seen, and I completely agree with you, people can and do get better, and they can be successfully housed despite the many challenges you might, you know, might see at somebody at their, you know, m at their illest and, and most uh, 
you know, needy moments uh, to see people transform and be successful. We, we do this every single day. Um, we do have a, approximately 800 more units in the Mayor's Office of Housing pipeline to build more housing that will, that will meet this need. The first building, I believe that the, the next one to be open will be uh, the site at 7th and Mission on the formal uh, parking lot uh, that we received from the federal government. So, but we do need that type of intervention. I think we also, um, I, I think that doesn't work for everybody, so community-based um, like co-op apartments, the kinds that we see uh, done by uh, PRC and Progress Foundation. Uh, I, ha I have uh, strong regard for the work that they do, and they are able to house people that don't, aren't going to do well in a 120-unit building. Um, I also believe that you know, we have the medical respite shelter uh, that Supervisor Kim advocated for for so many years. Um, I think we need more of like shelters or navigation centers that can serve high needs individuals who are not going to be successful inside. Um, we also have, but I do not believe we need more of, but um, maybe better coordinated use of stabilization units, which are essentially uh, single rooms uh, that serve as temporary shelter for somebody who can't uh, navigate a uh, congregate setting. Um, and lastly, I, I think we need more, um, I think programs like the Door Street uh, Clinic have been amazingly successful, uh, and I think we, we, need, we need more of those. But there's no one, like, lever. I think we, we do need more of everything, and we need to continue the work that we're doing to coordinate our efforts. We're not there yet, but we're way further along than we were a year ago. So, uh, oh, sorry, well, Chair Mandelman, I just have one more question, yes. and then I'll cede it back to you. Is there any document that exists in the city that quantifies, like that pre presents sort of a vision for a, um, a holistic system um, and then quantifies what the lack is in each of the sort of steps of a treatment cycle or a stabilization cycle? Is, uh, is there anything yeah. that exists like that? So that doesn't exist right now, but as you know, the mayor has announced uh, bringing on a director of mental health uh, reform, and we are counting on that individual to really help us get a handle on all the things that we do. Are we doing the right things? Are we doing them in the right uh, sequence? Are they in the right numbers? And so that will be one of the first deliverables of that engagement is to really help us look, we've been doing these things for a long time, but are they really being effective? And so we want to have that expert to come in and help us do that. And so that will be one of the things that, that comes out of it, is making sense of this, all of these programs, but how well do they work together and are they getting the outcomes that we really need to see to affect what we're seeing on the streets and the experiences of our citizens? Okay, and, and then I'll just make a comment and then I will <laughs> turn it over. I, just from this conversation, and this has, um, this has reflected my experience. I've been visiting every program we have in the city for about a year and a half now. I've met with all of you a hundred times. I, I, I mean, I've been trying to study the system left and right. It's taken me a year and a half even to begin to start to see where uh, the gaps are where you know um, the uh, lack of coordination exists. Uh, it's incredibly complicated. Um, to me, it is broken. And while I have uh, a lot, I mean, a tremendous respect for every single person that I'm looking at right now, um, and 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 I believe that we have some of the the top people in the country doing this work. Um, we've got to be the model for the nation. You know, the, the thing is, is that we know we have a broken mental health care system in the, the United States of America. So it, this is not just, you know, uh, particular to San Francisco, and, and I want to recognize that. But we have such brilliant people here. We have such incredible programs. We have so much empathy in our city leaders, and we have a massive city budget. And we are the ones to do this right, and I just don't see the leadership and I don't see the vision to get us there. And it's incredibly frustrating and it's something um, that I hope that we can change uh, in the coming years. Thank you, Chair Mandelman, for giving me so much time. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, and I'm 
sorry to take more <laughs> a, little, a few more minutes uh, from from your hearing, uh, Supervisor Stephanie. I um, you know I have shared the sort of the frustration that I think a lot of people feel about uh, the gaps in our uh, in our behavioral health system, and um, have talked about it a number of times with the mayor. And I I share your hope that this director of mental health reform, which I urged uh, the appointment of that person, will play um, an important role in doing what even as we provide oversight, none of us are mental health professionals. We don't actually know how to create a system that's going to work, but I do uh, want to applaud the mayor for her focus on this and for um, moving forward. Similarly to, I think, what happened with sort of uh, con consolidating and making sense of our um, homeless services delivery to do something similar around, uh, around behavioral health and make sure that we're actually spotting the gaps and filling them. The one piece of the system that I noticed nobody identified as um, a key critical need is, is in fact that community mental health dual diagnose, uh, dual diagnosis treatment capacity, which I think is, you know, again, there are all these different log jams, but having the place for the person who is both schizophrenic and right. meth using where they can get the treatment that they need is actually the hardest thing to find. And I think the answer to Supervisor Ronan's question is, you know, those people are hard to engage in treatment. So if you don't have a slot, it's real easy not to, and that can go on for a real long time. Whereas if we actually had those treatment slots, we could there's probably an almost endless supply of folks who we could bring in and, and fill those beds. And my understanding from talking with folks in that area is that we haven't expanded our, um, our capacity in that area in like 20 years. So even though the need has clearly grown on the streets, we see it every day, we don't have the additional progress or PRC or whatever um, nonprofit would be providing it, the sort of the, the longer term treatment, transitional um, tr treatment program uh, placements so anyway, that, I, I would just urge that, as we, particularly as we look at maybe another round of ERAF, that we think about that community mental health piece, yeah. um, looking at dual diagnosis. I have a question about how this, um, sort of the interaction of coordinated entry and DPH kind of works. Because my fear, and I'm hoping I, this will be assuaged, is that um, folks with a whole lot of stuff going on, a whole lot of challenges, who may not even know where they are or what's going on, have to get themselves to a place to be assessed for coordinated entry. And I'm hoping that's kind of not the case, but I wanted to understand how we, if those are the most vulnerable people, the people who are going in and out of PES all the time or getting jailed, but might not sort of get themselves, get themselves to the particular place where they can be assessed and given a priority and for coordinated entry, how we're thinking about that challenge. Um, I guess I'll take that yeah. one. So, uh, no, the people don't necessarily have to go to a place. Uh, if they can, that's ideal. But Hot Team is um, assessing people on the streets. We also can assess people at PES. Um, and can we at, do that? Yes. And at San Francisco General, I think we're going to expand that. We need to include Laguna Honda and are also working with the criminal justice system as well. But agree that, you know, there's no need to... Uh, require people to go to physical access points. That's the whole idea of, about having a single data system uh, that can work across multiple providers. And so your department has to like assign a priority level to each person. Correct. Um, and DPH is sort of working with people on their kind of like their mental health and physical health needs. How, what's the like how do you, so yesterday I went, there's a great new program at, um, at San Francisco General. It's related to getting to zero, and it's looking at um, HIV transmission, well, HIV and HIV transmission in the homeless population, and they've created this kind of wraparound thing where homeless folks can show up. Whenever they show up, they get their HIV sort of treatment, their meds, every, we, they, they get worked with. And they also get, you know, social workers who try to get them into, the, into, the, uh, into coordinated entry. They were saying it's a little bit of a mystery to them how the prioritization happens because, of course, from their perspective, I don't know, 80% of these folks are not only HIV positive but meth addicted and have um, mental health issues as well, and yet not all of them are a high priority for housing. So how does the, or a high priority, I guess, the yeah, high priority in the one system. So how does prioritization happen? So I, I want to point out that DPH and HSH uh, worked closely together to develop the prioritization tool, so it wasn't done, and we use, uh, when available to us, uh, medical data 
um, to help essentially do the, you know, use that data for the assessment. Um, so the prioritization is based on a number of factors, including length of homelessness, uh, current, you know, if somebody's in an emergent situation, uh, but also looking at uh, acuity based on a whole variety of factors and then weighting those across, um, you know, weighting all of the information we have. I think acuity uh, is the highest, uh, has the highest weighting, you know, factor if somebody is like very, very sick and needs to get uh, into housing, um, you know, they're gonna, they might get prioritized over somebody who's been homeless longer, uh, but doesn't have the same uh, risk to their, their own safety and health. And there's a good process in place where DPH can sort of, and HSH can sort of continue that conversation around prioritization if there's some category of folks who are like, yeah, we really ought to be trying to prioritize those more highly. Yes, I mean, we're meeting on a regular basis, both at the macro level on those issues, but also uh, on a weekly basis uh, at HSOC uh, addressing specific cases, uh, because at the end of the day, um, as Supervisor Ronan pointed out, there's more demand than there is supply, and it's we're not trusting just a computer to make uh, decisions. So, you know, human beings get involved and discuss particular cases uh, in order to serve the highest needs individuals. Also, we'll add, though, as we get more and more data into the system, uh, eventually we'll be able to use um, uh, technology to help us sort of adjust the uh, algorithm that's helping make the decisions around prioritization uh, to ensure people that we are losing, uh, you know, in the system for whatever reason, or people we think intuitively should be housed and aren't aren't showing up. We'll be able to um, consistently improve that um, you know, that process. Great, thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Chair Mandelman. I think the questions from my colleagues just clearly demonstrate that we're um, wanting to figure out how to do better, obviously. And I know that we have a presentation here that is going to, I think, expand upon some of the questions that we have. I'm really interested in continuing with the presentation. As I look at the slides, I feel like there's going to be information that we might have questions about right now that might be answered. But if I would really like to continue with the presentation and see, um, you know, I have all the departments here so that we could find out where we're, um, where we, like I said, where we could do better and what you need from us. So if I, I know, uh, Sue, I see Supervisor Walton's uh, name on the roster, if, if you'd like to ask some questions too. But I, I, I know that there's more slides here that I think that are really going to um, Maybe if it's a clarifying question on this particular slide or otherwise. It's a whole series of questions. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Okay, all right. So moving on to the next scenario, and this one involves the 5150 um, process. So this is a scenario of Alex, who lives on the streets in the Mission neighborhood, uh, and um, has there have been complaints from neighbors about uh, his behavior. In this case, uh, police respond, usually from a call into HSOC. Uh, police um, bring Alex into PES on a 5150 hold. Uh, PES, as you know, that uh, hold can uh, be up to 72 hours. In this case, PES stabilizes Alex, and he's released within 24 hours. While he's at PES, um, we will have social workers engaging with, with uh, Alex, and he will also then be referred, if he's homeless, to uh, a navigation center and also plugged into uh, outpatient services if he's uh, ready to receive them. Uh, he, anyone presenting to PES is presented with a referral to follow-up care, 100% of patients. Uh, that's either to an outpatient slot or it may be to Hummingbird. Uh, humming, um, PES is the largest referral source for Hummingbird patients. So that's really been a big improvement in our system to be able to have that place that's really close by for them to go. Uh, and while that person's at PES, then they're plugged into the whole DPH system. Uh, so I want to pause because Supervisor Stephanie, I know this is an uh, area you really wanted to focus on. And uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Mark Leary from uh, psychiatry at San Francisco General who actually operates PES. Okay, okay. So if there are any questions you have about the PES process? I, I do. No, you go first. This is your hearing. 
<laughs> All right, so my question is, um, I guess I have two. One is, uh, so the, um, the recent audit of the behavioral health services system found that 38% of folks who leave PES are leaving without a referral. Um, I think DPH disputes that and disputed it in the hearing. The BLA didn't change its belief that that's what's happening. So how do we kind of, is there any way that you can help us make sense of why the BLA is quite convinced that 38, at least when they did that, that survey or that study, that 38% of folks were getting sent out without a referral and DPH thinks that's not what ha what's happening? I'd be happy to address that. Okay. Um, PES, uh, to state again, um, refers everyone who leaves PES um, who's not being admitted to an inpatient unit to outpatient services. And the origin of, of the 38% on the audit um, is an artifact of our a faulty drop-down menu in our PES medical record. So that um, the 38% were, was attached to um, a category called discharge to self. And it's an unfortunately um, vague and general item on our drop-down menu, which we've since corrected. Um, but that category included people that were already connected to the mental health system that were being discharged basically on their own. They weren't being taken into a treatment program. They were leaving um, to pursue ongoing treatment. It also included people that were being discharged with a referral to the Behavioral Health Access Center or to TAP. Um, so that uh, we, we disputed this before in the draft process and, and thereafter, but it, it wasn't changed, unfortunately. I, I'm, I've, I have very direct uh, knowledge of that process, and I'm very certain that that's the case. Okay. So... Then I actually, okay, so then the other question is, are social workers there 24 hours a day at PES? Social workers are, um, are not in PES at the present time 24 hours a day. There's um, going to be an addition uh, of two new social workers that are going to be um, working in PES. Um, they're in the process of being hired at this point. Um, our clinical model in PES has been... Um, to have psychiatrists 24 seven and registered nursing staff 24 seven, psychiatric nurses. And the psychiatric nurses um, are extremely active and primary in, in the process of arranging for follow up after discharge from PES. But in terms of like thinking about, and they would work on something like thinking about housing or the, is this person in the, in the coordinated entry system or something like that? Right. And the in nurses. Would. All aspects of discharge, okay. both psychiatric follow up, substance abuse follow up okay. and housing follow up. And wouldn't the ideal world, I mean, so we're talking about the system and how it's supposed, but wouldn't the ideal world be a warm handoff for every single person who leaves? I mean, if we were, you know, creating the perfect system that I think Supervisor Stephanie and we all want, wouldn't a pretty significant number of the folks who leave PES either get walked to Hummingbird or driven to another Hummingbird that we've created and a relatively small number of them be released um, with a referral? Well, I think um, it would be according, in an ideal world, each client would get exactly what they need clinically and the level of care that they need. And it's difficult for me to say what percentage of people leaving PS would need an escort versus who would be able to on their own. It's probably more than are getting it now though, right? I would agree. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, uh, Supervisor Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Leary. I, um, following up on the question that I had when we, uh, when I toured, thank you mm -hmm. for that, by the way, and thank you for your good work. I know that, um, I know that it's a taxing environment, and that you are really, honestly, um, doing great work at SF General. And when I asked about people who are leaving PES, and do so, of course. Um, at that point in time, you can't, they can't be held any longer. When the determined, on a 5150 I'm talking about, when, mm -hmm. when no, they are no longer a danger to themselves or others and they're released. And at that point, voluntarily, I asked whether or not you thought 
um, if offered a bed or offered something else, they would go. Because at that point in time, they could just go. There's nothing that, that we could do. But if we were to offer them services at that point, I, um, you made a remark to me that I thought was pretty profound in terms of how many people you thought, um, or percentage-wise, would actually take help. And if you could just expand upon that a little bit. Well, I think that um, there's a range of, of people that, that are seen in PES, and I think that most people, um, once their psychiatric crisis has resolved in PES and they no longer um, meet the criteria to be held against their will, and, and they're homeless, um, most of them would want to be able to um, accept a, a, shelter, a, a shelter, I mean that in the most generic of terms, a, a place where they could stay, a bed. Right. And then I asked how, how many beds you thought we might need to accommodate that population, and you said? You know, that's a very, I actually don't remember exactly <laughs> what number I gave you because it's, it's not a number that I have any confidence in. Right. Um, we need, um, there's great need there, um, and uh, it's, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question, um, but it's a large number. Right. We were th thinking 200 to even 400 beds, I think, that we were. It's, you know, we need to do a very careful assessment of exactly how many we need, but I, I think it's a large number. And, and that's really, honestly, what I'm trying to get at in terms of those that are leaving the hospital, um, whether or not we have the services, whether or not we have the beds, those that are coming through... Um, the other uh, BHAC and everything, whether or not, because you are the only people that can tell us what you, what those individuals need. So that's really um, what I'm hoping we leave with today. And, uh, I would add that the, um, excuse, just that the, the importance of having um, those patients have a bed is that their their clinicians, their case managers, can find them or have a much greater chance of finding them in that location right, because to be it, able it, to sustain ongoing treatment. Also, too, with, you know, a lot of people that go into PES, you know, are, they could be under the influence of methamphetamine or um, alcohol at that point, and then when they sober up, to have the ability to transfer to a bed where you continue days of sobriety, where your mind becomes more clear, where you get a chance to really maybe at that point think that I've had enough and I do want to get help, the longer we're able to provide that type of environment for an individual who has substance abuse issues, and the longer we're able to provide a space where they're not on the street, tempted to use, the better it is and the more likely we are to be able to exit them into a treatment bed. And so that's what I'm really hoping to find out, is like how many beds what what could we be doing at that time to help those people? Especially, it's not, it's not just, you know, a lot of people that are on 5150 holds do not have a mental illness. A lot of people that are on 5150 holds have had, are just are addicted to alcohol or alcoholics or have a, a drug problem. So at that point in time, I just want to be able to capture those individuals and provide them a place where they can go where it's not back out on the streets, because you don't get well in the environment where you are sick. You don't get well in the environment where, where you're sick. We need to provide an environment where people can have days away from using meth, have days away from that first drink, have people that are interacting with them in that environment that are sober, people that are interacting with them that are case managers, that tell them there's a better way and we have an option for you. We have a treatment bed, Progress Foundation, whatever. I want that space for those individuals. And I feel like that's what we're lacking right now. And I want to be told by the professionals, this is really what we need, even if it is pie in the sky, even if it is 400 beds. Because even though we might not be able to do it as a city and county, we can ask our partnering hospitals, we can ask other people to help us because I know that the other hospitals, they don't have 24 seven psychiatric care. Maybe they should. So maybe they should have beds. Maybe they should help out as well. So that's just re that's really um, what I'm hoping that we find out. And I'm hoping that um, we as a city and county can figure out how to provide that. Supervisor Ronan. 
Yes, just to follow up on, on Supervisor Mandelman's question about the um, audit of behavioral health services and the statistic about 80% of people leaving P PES without a referral. When I asked um, Severin from the Budget and Legislative Analyst about that statistic and why it didn't change, what she told me is that, yes, people might be handed a piece of paper with a referral, but there, there's no appointment made for them at that at that you know, referral, that the waiting time to that referral might be several months. Um, so to her, it feels like the person is sort of just released without any follow-up, um, which, which seemed reasonable to me. And I just wanted to get your response to that. And again, this isn't about blaming. It's about just figuring out what we need to advocate for. So the more that we know that the truth, the, no, the more we know how to fix it, right? So, but, but to me, that felt like a valid reason for not changing the statistic. Well, when someone is, is new to our system or they're, they've been here a while and are not linked and they come to PES and are discharged, um, what we do most often is provide them with a referral to the Behavioral Health Access Clinic, BHAC, or TAP, um, because that's the portal of entry to the mental health system. They can go in and they can walk right in or call directly and speak 24-7 to a clinician on the phone or walk in and get an assessment that day. And as was mentioned earlier by Cabos, they, they'll be assessed for what level of care they need within the system, whether it's outpatient care or more residential, whether it's substance abuse. So um, they are able to get that initial entry into the mental health system pretty much immediately there. And then an appointment would be set up for them at some, you know, at some later time. And, and I'm not sure exactly at this, at this point in time how long in, they would uh, wait for the first available appointment, but it's relatively soon. Um, and Is, that's, that's, what, that's what we do. Does anybody track how many people go yeah. from PES to TAP or BHAC? I know there's, there are efforts underway to track that. Um, I haven't seen data about exactly how many people follow up. We d and it depends. With some people, we if it's uh, during the day, per, only during the day, we will um, at times um, taxi someone over to be hacked directly to try to mm -hmm. to make sure to increase the likelihood that they're actually going to to enter the system. So, Supervisor Ronan, we recognize that data is lacking, so we actually have started tracking, uh, starting this fiscal year, the referral the follow-up rate from PES. We do have some stats to share with you. Uh, for example, a, um, a, a, a percentage of those PES clients actually do get admitted to inpatient psych psychiatry at San Francisco General, and of, of the 52% 52, 52 of inpatient dischargers, are seen for a follow-up mental health and substance abuse appointment within seven days. So we want to be able to get that same kind of information for PES, and we're just now beginning to track it. Okay. All right, let's keep going. And um, there was a question about uh, how does someone with a physical, a homeless person with a physical health issue, how are they seen and coordinated through our system? So this, this last scenario is Maria, who's living on the streets of Soma and has open sores on her legs. Uh, the DPH Street Medicine team, headed by Dr. Zevin, uh, will encounter Maria on the street. Uh, and treat her uh, abscesses right there on the spot, uh, and also then refer her to primary care or urgent care, probably at Tom Waddell Urgent Care Clinic. Uh, at the same time, uh, SF hot workers would be called to the scene to begin to engage with Maria, and at that point, Maria is started within the coordinated entry system of HSH in terms of housing options that might be available for her. And so again, the goal is treat her immediate needs on the street, make a referral back to a more permanent uh, source of medical care, primary care or urgent care, but then also make sure she gets plugged into the coordinated entry system for housing priority. And just the final slide from DPH before we turn it over to our colleagues from HSH. Uh, 
is to show some of the investments we've made. Um, we've all seen as citizens of San Francisco what's occurring uh, on our streets and the suffering of our citizens with mental health and substance abuse issues. So we, as we begin to see this tide growing, these are the investments we've made over the past few years. Uh, Dr. Zevin, in his scenario, talked about uh, the individual who was the first person in our pilot program for, for um, low barrier medication, the buprenorphine treatment. We started that pilot in 2016, and it's now been expanded in 2018. Uh, we also started health fairs, and these are health fairs throughout the city uh, in uh, almost every uh, supervisorial district where we have our, our early prevention specialists who are out there engaging with individuals. Uh, HSH uh, is involved. Uh, we uh, also opened the Hummingbird Place in 2017 with the original 15 beds, and now we've added uh, 14 more and up to 29. And again, Hummingbird is always full. Um, we started our HSOC coordination among our three departments plus the uh, police department and DPW, and HSOC has evolved. Uh, it's really, uh, I think, a really good working process where we're all together and prioritizing what's going on out in the community. Uh, we talked about the Healing Center, the collaboration between UCSF, Dignity Health, and DPH where we opened those 40 beds at the Healing Center. And we've uh, actually... Now 54, right? Now 54. Yes, thanks to the ERAF funding, we've been able to expand those bids. And um, we also talked about the expansion of Hummingbird. And we're also uh, planning, expecting in July of this year, opening 72 new transitional housing beds for people with uh, existing substance use treatment services. So this is just a down payment on all the work we know that still needs to be done. Uh, as Barry and others have said, we, we know we need more, and we probably need more of everything. It's a question of what are the, what's the proportion of the, that more, and we're really working hard with all of our partners to really figure that out and figure it out quickly so that we can come back to you and say this is what we need. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, my colleague and, and my partner, and um, Carrie Abbott from HSH. And Carrie and I actually uh, oversee the coordination process between DPH and HSH, and, along with Susie uh, from HSA. So we are all three departments working closely together uh, to really have the biggest impact possible. <laughs> 